we try to finance lower middle market commercial customers and we can pancake the cost of doing these smaller deals and we can go down in the scale and today as we speak we are doing projects starting at $100,000 or more. Welcome to the Solar Podcast. I'm your host, Benoit Thanjan, and I'm happy to be here with Abhinash Tiwari, who's the CIO of Blue Flame Energy Finance. Abhinash and I have actually known each other for now. It's maybe seven years. We met at that solar finance conference in New York when I was at Vanguard Energy Partners, and I'm excited to have it. It's actually our first interview on the podcast, Mm -hmm. and I'm excited to have Abhinash because he has so much experience with energy transactions, specifically solar. I knew him at Constellation, and it's amazing. What I love about Abhinash is his knowledge of the industry, his transparency, and he always says what he's going to do, you know, so these are three important things. I think it would be great, Abhinash, if you could give a, a background of your experiences and how you got to being the CIO of Blue Flame. Thanks, Benoit. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Thank you. It for has being been here. great knowing you over the years. Uh, we have become friends more than sort of industry colleagues uh, <laughs> over the years. My interest in energy started as an undergrad. I majored in electrical engineering, but I always believed that the world is going to run out of fossil fuels. And so we have to figure out alternate ways to produce energy as well as consume energy more efficiently. So I studied electrical engineering with a minor in energy engineering. I have worked in the industry for over 15 years now. As a matter of fact, after that, I I worked in a startup and then ended up going to business school to do an MBA. And after that, I worked on Wall Street doing energy investment banking and uh, Pretty soon after, thereafter, I moved to Constellation to be part of uh, their, what they used to call it is energy services business, which transformed into kind of distributed energy origination and just the deregulated business. In Constellation, initially I was doing project finance and structured finance and uh, quickly moved to origination, which is where I spent over six years in Constellation. Well, it was Constellation when I started and yes. it became Exelon. Uh, so when you're saying origination, you're basically working with solar developers for Constellation to invest and building yes. those relationships. Exactly. So let me step back and kind of get to why Constellation got into this business to begin with. So Constellation is the largest retail energy provider in the country. At one point, we had 70, 80,000 commercial customers across the country. And we slowly started seeing a trend that some of the energy customers were actually installing distributed energy projects, primarily solar, on their buildings. And that was not a good data point for an energy supplier because our margins were driven by what we supplied. So if people start generating their own energy, we were kind of losing out on that. And so we figured we can do that ourselves, i.e. we can be an energy producer and supplier on the customer site. Yeah. And that's where we got into that business. Obviously, the, the company was fairly large. We were organized as a utility holding company. What that meant was we had pretty good credit rating, had strong balance sheet, and had tax appetite. So we started investing in solar projects. The thought process was both, to answer your question, build relationship with installers, but also tap into our existing customer base. Mm-hmm. So we started thinking that we are going to tap into our customer base. And then pretty quickly, over, over a period of like one to two years, we realized that local installers are the best suited folks to advance projects on the ground. And so we started partnering up with local either installers or EPCs and so on and so forth to find projects that will we will advance and invest in. Sure. Were you one of the first people in that group or started that Absolutely. group? Absolutely. I was one of the first persons in that group. I literally built the financial model, which was used to evaluate solar investments by Constellation. I was part of the initial sort of team that figured out how to look at the returns on different assets and how to compare those returns and so on and so forth. So yes, there were a bunch of other people basically, but I was there from the very, very beginning. Definitely. Brains behind uh, some of the most complex structures and financing and structuring we did. I can imagine. I mean, especially once you include tax equity into the equation, Mm -hmm. it creates a lot of complicated structuring. And uh, Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're an expert on all the different, 
you know, partnership flip, flip inverted lease, yep. sale lease back, mm-hmm. capital accounts, what to do, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> all the exciting stuff, which Sold we won't up. go into detail, but uh, that's amazing. Yeah, exactly. Obviously, I've known Abinash for a long time, and you're obviously working at a utility and I think I was looking at your bio. You've worked on $2 billion worth of project. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And I think it was, what, 180 megawatts or 200? 200 200 and change. I mean, when I started, we had 5 megawatts of projects. When I left, we had 400 megawatts of, like, distributed generation projects. So that is the extent. Obviously, not all of those were my deals, but a lot of those were my deals. And then at that time, too, you were doing a lot of deals in California, from yes. And Maryland, obviously. Yes. Basically, we started doing this. I guess I talked about why we at Constellation, we got into this business. Another factor which I forgot to mention was SREX. As an energy supplier, we had a fundamental need for SREX for compliance reasons. And that was a quintessential build versus buy decision sure. uh, in front of us. And we kind of figured that, well, if we can do some projects in these states, especially Maryland and, and other northeastern states, then that will be attractive for us because we'll get SREX as part of the package. And uh, we can use those SREX on a long-term basis to for compliance reasons. So that was fairly attractive. Although that was not the primary driver because Definitely. we could also buy SREX in the market. Sure. And SREX are basically a solar renewable energy credit that equals one megawatt hour of solar energy. And basically certain states like Maryland, New Jersey, Massachusetts, as part of the compliance obligation, you would have to have a certain generation in renewables and solar. And SREX is a way of basically meeting the compliance obligation. So it's not only getting the return on solar obviously the proper investment return that they're looking for, but also meeting your SREC obligation. That's correct? Exactly. So anyway, the reason I brought up SREX is because initially we were doing deals on the East Coast, and then pretty quickly we realized that SREC markets are fundamentally driven by demand and supply, i.e. they are subject to more sort of fluctuations. So I started seeing that the deals we closed at 8%, 9% return were actually printing 5% returns because of the assumptions we made on SREX going in. And a year later, we were kind of doing much worse than we expected to do. Primary example of that is, and since Ben, you are from New Jersey, I think uh, think I'll mention to you, (laughs) uh, we did, I started seeing a couple of things, basically. One, New Jersey SREX were very, very high. And so, People started doing deals, folks started doing deals just based on SREX, and that was not a good trend. I never wanted to be in the business of zero cent power supply to customers. Sure. Uh, I always thought power has more value than SREX fundamentally because power is something people need. SREX is something which is created by regulators. Yes. People don't that, need That's a great SREX. point. So that, that was one. And then two, we started in terms of our portfolio management efforts, we started realizing that we are making much less return on some of those deals than what we expected a year, even a year back or six sure. months back especially after New Jersey Estrek market crash. Then I started looking at other markets. And, and by the way, we had done some California deals, but we were not here physically on the West Coast, so it was kind of too far and, and whatnot. But after that, we kind of started looking at other markets. And we'll, we'll look at some development projects in, on the East Coast in New Jersey or Maryland, and we'll develop it for six months and then realize that the strict prices have tanked. So sure. all the fundamental premises we made to offer a PPA rate to a customer and advance all the entitlement process was kind of vested by the time we mm-hmm. got to the finish line. So anyway, this is a long way in a day of answering that. Yes, that was the reason why we started looking at projects in California and Arizona and sure. other Western states because there were no SREX. And basically, there was a sort of a fixed incentive, high electricity costs, exactly. a fixed rebate. The challenging thing with SREX is that it's hard to get long-term contracting. SREX are very volatile, mm-hmm. especially in New Jersey. Abinash is talking about the SREX market crash due to an oversupply of too many projects being built, yep. meaning that there was an oversupply of SREX for the actual demand, which then lowered the prices. And um, that's really helpful for you to explain. You know, what's interesting to me is, obviously, we're coming from Constellation, which is part of Exelon, which is a utility, which there's a lot of job stability, to Mm -hmm. now working at a startup, being the CIO of Blue Flame Energy Finance. Can you talk about, like, what made you 
make the transition. Obviously, you're based in Baltimore because that's where Constellation's located now. We're actually in their beautiful offices in Carlsbad, California. What made you do that? You obviously were, I think, at Constellation for maybe five or six years. Yep. To then make that transition. Oh, seven years. To Mm -hmm. make that transition. Can you talk about that, your entrepreneurial journey, which the Solar Maverick podcast is about solar and entrepreneurship? Yep, perfect. And so... I had a really good run at Constellation. Part of it was what I did and what we did as a team, but part of it was just growth in the solar industry. And uh, it started to become fairly predictable in terms of what we were doing at Constellation, at least what I was doing at Constellation. We had a certain box, we had a certain capital allocation, and we tried to deploy that capital in a certain type of projects. We did deviate from that box, but it was not a whole lot. So... After year over year, we'll do that. And I had good years and great years, basically. And I started to sort of crave for something new and different. And uh, one of the things I mentioned earlier on the podcast is that Constellation used to supply power to tens of thousands of commercial customers. And when we look to serve them through PPA or distributed generation offerings, I realized that we did not have a financing vehicle to finance those projects. And so effectively, out of, call it 75,000 customers, there are only 5,000 we can write PPAs for. 70,000 customers were not qualified for our PPA financing because of their credit ratings or how they are structured or how their financials looked. So started uh, sort of talking about that with our industry friends, and that was kind of the genesis of Blue Flame. We thought that there has to be a financing vehicle or some financing sort of structures that will work for lower in the credit sort of middle market commercial customers. And also, since Ad Constellation or any large financier spends a lot of money in transaction costs, we figured we have to do technology, advanced technology to sort of lower the transaction costs. So Blue Flame is the mixture of both of these pieces. We try to finance lower middle market commercial customers, and we use a lot of technology to not just project qualification, but also underwriting and sort of slicing and dicing and managing the pipeline and so on and so forth. And the idea behind all that, this is that we can pancake the cost of doing these smaller deals and we can go down in the scale. And today, as we speak, we are doing uh, projects, we're financing projects starting at $100,000 or more. And we can actually... I shouldn't say we make a lot of money doing those, but we don't lose money. And that is the key point. So so the idea is, can we do smaller projects? Can we solve for the credit? And, and we can talk about that a little bit more later. But anyway, to my sort of journey from Exelon slash Constellation to Blue Flame was driven by trying to solve this problem of lower middle market commercial financing. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a huge market opportunity. I think a lot of mm-hmm. companies are actually trying to solve you know, when you have commercial, industrial, non-rated credit, yep. when you have projects below 500 kilowatts, mm-hmm. it's very difficult to find financing. And I'm excited because I think your model is unique and different from what I've heard from other investors in, in the space. How long has Blue Flame been in existence? Mm-hmm. What I know you initially talked about how you started in PACE financing and if you could talk about what PACE financing is and then now how you've pivoted the model Mm -hmm. and how you differentiate yourself from other financiers. By the way, I know that's multiple questions, so I apologize. Yeah, Uh, no, that's that's a good question. That is story of our lives here. So I started with Blue Flame in March of 2016. I'm just trying to make sure I'm not getting the year wrong. Yes. So it's, well, two it's and already half, been a, two and a half years. years. Wow. Yes. Time flies by. Close. Blue Flame was operationalized three years back. I knew the founders very well and I wanted to sort of be part of that story. So I have been involved in the business from the very beginning, actually, even before the the beginning was there. In the fintech financial technology model, we wanted to find a financing structure that will work for a lot of customers. And that is where PACE, which is property assist clean energy, came in. And effectively, the structure uses the value of the real estate as backstop, credit backstop for financing. And because the backstop itself is attached to the property taxes. Well, I mean, generally in most of the states, you can actually do base financing as an assessment to the property. 
So it just becomes part of the property. It's just like any owner that owns that property will have to pay it just like they pay their property taxes. So it just gets tied to the property. And you can actually finance a lot of projects, qualify and finance a lot of projects versus like, using a traditional sort of unsecured or PPA model. So that was the genesis of it. We figured since we are trying to build a cookie cutter approach to small commercial financing and want to do like really small projects, we wanted an easy way to kind of qualify projects quickly, price them, and then offer standard documentation to finance it. However, once we kind of built our technology stack and and launched that effort initially in California and then in Texas and New York states, which are also PACE eligible states. So there are up and running commercial PACE programs in those states. Uh, We realized that PACE financing in itself is a great concept, but it has some limitations. And those are two primarily. One is footprint related. So if you go to a place and find a customer, then you realize that you have to actually get that county or that city opted into a PACE program. And that becomes kind of a fairly long drawn process. And oftentimes customers are not patient to wait for that opt-in process. It could take six months a year and it is fairly uncertain because you're going through the town council and city manager and so on and so forth. So that's one. And two, we also realize that a number of even small commercial properties have existing mortgages. And if you Think about PACE, it runs with property taxes, so it is on the top of the waterfall, cash waterfall on the property, and those mortgage holders are generally not comfortable putting an assessment on the property which they are financing. And so that becomes kind of a lender consent process, which becomes fairly long drawn. And now, if you think about like that process, I think that's fair. They should be involved. The existing lenders should be involved in that PACE assessment being put on the property. But on the flip side, the projects we are trying to do are small. And so the time and effort needed to get those consents is just way too much. And basically what we realize is that if we are spending two, three, four months to get a consent, we are kind of getting back to the same issue of like higher transaction costs, which we had on traditional commercial financing or PPA or traditional methods of financing. So we took the good parts of PACE, which is basically it is backstopped by real estate as a credit enhancement mechanism. And PACE is actually always non-recourse to the property owner or the building owner or the business that is housed in the property. Uh, it just becomes fairly clean. And it also runs fairly consistent with our fundamental view that any energy improvement typically becomes integral part of the property. So it's not like you put solar panels on a building and you can take it away three months later if there's a default, payment default. So we took those ideas and we have developed two new financing products now which uses good parts of PACE without the issues of jurisdiction or like existing mortgage holders issues. And effectively, these products are basically mortgage style loans on the property, which runs longer term than traditional sort of local bank financing can do. So we'll do 15 years to 25 year like sort of amortization and then 10 to 15 year term. So we are doing two structures. One is like 10, 25 structure, 10 year term, 25 year sort of amort and 15 year term and 15 year amort as well. So that is working really, really well. That just opens up the market for us to go to lower 48 states. That's what we are authorized to by our warehouse line provider. And so we are going after that. And that is the structure which we use on the properties which does not have existing mortgage. If a property has existing mortgage, then what we do is we stand in line behind the existing mortgage holders in terms of the collateral. And uh, we use insurance mechanism or insurance construct to kind of beef up that collateral value or collateral quality to the ultimate capital providers and just do a junior secured financing. So the previous structure is senior secured financing. The structure I just mentioned to you is junior secured financing. That's what we are using. And and the beauty of this is we can go to any state, any jurisdiction, and actually still finance fairly small projects. That's huge because, as you said, PACE is really limited to certain states and jurisdictions. So this creates a huge opportunity in the market. And it sounds like the cost of financing as well compared to PACE. Yes. So cost of financing, well, just the bare bone cost or yield you need on PACE is probably slightly lower, but 
you have other fees which you need to account for. So eventually everything said and done is purely comparable irrespective of the structure. So by definition, Pace will be cheaper than senior secured and senior secured will be cheaper than junior secured. But sure. the, the differences are de minimis. Yep, we have seen definitely. in practice we are closing and looking at more deals which use senior secured structure than Pace as we speak. Pace is a great construct where it works, but it doesn't work everywhere. And the question is, do we all as an industry wait for Pace to become available everywhere or do we use tools which we already have to enable projects while we actually expand Pace? Sure. And we have taken the second path here. Definitely. And it sounds like Bluefame has also taken to account uh, velocity and scalability with the platform that you've created. Yep. I've obviously seen the platform and obviously you guys provide a demo of the platform for people to see. Can you talk a little bit about how the platform really helps to kind of do things a lot quicker? So basically anybody who wants to look at our platform can go to blueflameenergyfinance.com, just one word, very long URL, and request for a demo. We are happy to kind of set you up and show you what we do and how we, we do it in terms of the technology. But effectively, our whole platform is fully integrated end-to-end to enable financing into a small commercial market. There are two ways you can use it. The most common is just our pricing tool. So we provide what we call quick pricer. And by the way, we call our platform HyperQual. The idea is we are hyper-efficient in qualifying projects quickly for anybody. So you can access HyperQual quick pricer to price, uh, put an address and basic parameters on a project and choose the product you're going to use, which we offer, and get a price quote instantaneously. And if you like what you see, you can download the basic parameters just for your records and keep it and send it to customers. Or if you want, you can request a term sheet online so that somebody on our team will receive that and review it quickly and issue it to you, basically, which can actually be presented to your customers. So the idea is this is pretty much a self-service portal for small commercial financing. And this is anything in energy, right? It's LED this lighting, is, yeah, energy exactly, efficiency. Exactly. Solar. Yeah, so the fundamental premise we follow is that anything we are financing should actually be accretive to the customer or the property owner. So it should save them money. And, and that is the fundamental premise. We don't want to finance upside down deals. But on the flip side, we want to finance anything which saves money because we feel like after the property owner has done the project and has gone through the financing process, their NOI or the value of the building or property will increase because they are saving money. Obviously, solar is a major part of our business, but we can also finance anything which is related to energy. Some of the primary examples are LED lighting or even like a small CHP system or energy efficiency or cool roof, uh, which comes up fairly regularly, especially in California with rooftop solar projects. Interesting. So we do all of those using our financing structure. Great. I know you mentioned you do a lot of solar, and obviously you could do it in any of the 50 states. Are you still seeing, though, a concentration in the states that you tend to do more solar, like obviously California, yep. Arizona? Absolutely. I mean, we would like to do more in other states. And frankly speaking, as a any sort of new business, we are still kind of ramping up our outreach efforts in other states. A lot of what we do is in California, but we are starting to see more and more flow from states like Texas or New Jersey. And I think based on what we are seeing in terms of our pipeline, we are going to see more flow from states like Illinois, Minnesota, and also Florida maybe, and mass market. Sure. Well, Florida, right? PPA yep. is illegal, right? So. Yeah, PP has become legal in Florida now, which is good. But I mean, if you think about what we are trying to do here, we are trying to do a kind of loan type structure. Sure. We have signed a deal using our loan structure as a PPA. At this scale, we all know, I wish there was more supply sure. of tax equity to finance like really small projects. But our structure does work with that as well. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah. Because I was thinking just it's an ownership model, but that, that's it's interesting. A, yes, it's an ownership model, but you can also, if you think about it, we can actually loan money to the property owner, and then they can turn around and sort of use that proceed either as a prepayment or just like a traditional sort of structure wherein the tax equity partnership is subsidizing the cost of the project. In simple terms, if a project costs $100, and either we come in and fund $100 or we come in and fund 
seventy dollars, and someone else comes in as tax equity investor and, and funds the thirty dollars, and that just reduces the payment by the property owner. Sure. And you still use the same structure as we do in our traditional sort of financing, and same collateral and credit enhancement mechanisms. Interesting. Not to go a little bit different to talk more about your entrepreneurship journey. Mm -hmm. You've been at Blue Flame two and a half years. Yep. And I know before you worked in corporate environments. What have you learned the two and a half years of, of being an entrepreneur? I guess I didn't use the word pivot uh, <laughs> uh, as much as I do now. Yeah. But as as a small business, as a startup, you are always looking at how the market reacts to what you're trying to do and then change course. And you have to do that super quickly because you don't have the liberty and the stability of a very large business. And pretty much you learn as you go. And actually that has been pretty exciting because you can change course, you can do different things and basically change direction and execute quickly. And it's a lot of fun. One other thing I, I, I always kind of say that to people I work with day in and day out is that in my previous job, if there was a deal to be done, I'll sort of negotiate the contracts and close the deal. And then somebody else in the company will process the funds and pay the installers and whatnot. And it was just like a pretty smooth process. But as a small business who is basically kind of managing funds and so on and so forth from a large institutional investor, which is our primary source of capital, actually, it just is a lot of work to move money. There's a deal which <laughs> needs money and there's an investor and capital which is ready to go to that deal. But there's a lot of plumbing which is required to make, make the money flow. It's an incredible amount of work. I did not appreciate that in a, as part of a large business. Things just happened for me when I wanted them to sure. happen. Here, you have to pay attention to even like really, really small things, which I did not have to worry in my past life. Definitely. And we're talking about a lot of your businesses in solar energy. What sort of interesting trends are you seeing in the industry that you would like to talk about? I know everyone talks about solar plus storage and mm -hmm. it being economical. Hopefully, in the near future, is there any big trends that you're seeing that hasn't been talked about? Or... Yeah, I mean, I think software is going to become immensely important in this space. In my mind, solar is a fairly inert technology. You just put it in the sun and it generates power, which you're supposed to use, more or less. Storage is not that. Storage is a very flexible asset. And we talk about solar and storage, but I think the real play is software, which is going to optimize how storage and solar or, and any other sort of distributed generation source is going to interact with the grid and different market signals, basically. And that is going to be incredibly important. Sure. I think the real trend is like software, not storage is important. The storage is what makes what is being used by the software, but software is going to be much more important than storage itself. Definitely. That makes sense. The software is basically going to help you monetize the mm -hmm. benefits with the storage and you need that sort of plumbing, right? Almost. Yep to do that. So that's the great point. What suggestions do you have about someone entering the solar industry? It's the solar roller coaster, as we all joke about. <laughs> <laughs> there are ups and downs, you know, obviously, it's been a little more challenging with tariffs on panels, mm -hmm. and that's slowed the development. But we're still obviously seeing solar is here to stay renewables are here to stay. Yep. What suggestions do you have with people who are thinking about getting into the industry or advice that you have since you're a veteran? Yeah, I wouldn't say. Well, there are more <laughs> veterans than I am. But I would say just get involved. Try to put your hands on things which are being done. Is this question more meant for students or like newcomers or guys who are in the industry? Um, I would say people in the industry. I think a lot of times people lose hope because nah. there's so much change and there's not a lot of stability. People are always moving from job to job just because the economic situation of certain companies change yes. or, or not I mean, around solar, anymore. The way I see that is solar is no different from any other industry in the sense that we talk about pretty stable industries today, like utilities, for example, which people in solar industry love to hate. If you think about utilities like 100, 150 years back, when there was people who were moving from like sort of gas lamps to like some sort of like natural gas powered heating and lighting and whatnot, Back in those days, I'm sure the utilities were like pretty unstable businesses. So 
I guess thinking about it differently, I think solar coaster is part of the just solar being new and growing and there is going to be growing pains and that is not going to go away. That is always be there. I guess over the years, I think we have come pretty far and have become a much more stable industry, but there's still a lot of churn and that's just part of, I guess, growing pains. But that should not sort of deter anyone from entering into this industry because the tailwinds are there behind solar and distributed generation in general fundamentally and it is not going to go away be it solar generation or be it storage or be it electric vehicles and so on and so forth that is here to stay that is not going anywhere i don't know how we get from here to a totally 100 percent electric future but 50 years from now i do see everything being electrified so it is going to happen it is bound to happen so the question is like, do you want stability or do you want to join the fun and <laughs> and go for the ride? If you want to go for the ride, this is this is for you. Definitely. And can you talk about too, you already kind of mentioned this, how Blue Flame is different from other financing sources. Obviously, you talked a little bit about doing smaller deal size, velocity, scalability. Mm -hmm. Is there any other major differentiators? So we, two or three things. We try to position ourselves as financiers that can do 100% financing on any solar projects we look at. That is our kind of default. We also use the property as a credit enhancement mechanism and not use personal or corporate guarantees for credit enhancement. So these are our like sort of main differentiators. We are not trying to be your local commercial bank. We are not trying to be your leasing company. We're just a, a specialized source of capital that can do solar loans on a you know reasonably long term. Still not 25 years, I wish 30 years or so. We are fairly long term and and we can close deals quickly. Sure, which is the biggest impediment yep. in a lot of solar deals is mm -hmm. the time that it actually takes to close these transactions. Hey, Abhinash, what are the key things you've learned? Obviously, you have a lot of experience with deal making. You've developed over 250 megawatts and invested one plus billion in solar. What are some of the key takeaways that you've learned from all the deals you've worked on? It's kind of funny. You go from deal to deal and every deal is different and characters involved in every deal is different or are different. But uh, there are a couple of fairly fundamental things that you can take from deal to deal. One is you are as a quarter back to these deals, you're always trying to find solutions which actually are helpful to everybody. And it doesn't really mean that everyone wins or it's not a kind of a zero-sum game. It's, it's just like people come out on the other side of the deal with reasonable outcomes for them individually. So that's that's like the key. And two is just relationships. And I guess I'm kind of old school in terms of relationships, more than sort of being in front of people all the time or sort of socializing and so on and so forth. I have always fundamentally believed that you have to add value. And that is the key. If you add value to people, people will work with you and you feel it more accomplishment doing that. And, and that actually drives more business versus like just trying to be friendly with everybody, basically. I'm a very friendly person. Generally, I'm pretty nice. But... That is not the driver. Example comes to my mind wherein I was competing for a pretty large portfolio with a Yilco, which is no more here. So <laughs> <laughs> you probably can guess the name. And we were going head to head and our cost of capital was higher than the Yilco three, four years back. But the installer or the EPC who was involved in the deal, he literally put a number to what value I have added to the deal in the process, and, and we got the deal, basically. That was kind of eye-opening for me. I mean, he's a very good friend. I used to joke with him that you put like 10 cents or 7 cents of value on my sort of value add to the project, which is <laughs> kind of funny. I, I was, I, But anyway, the point was, he was like, no, you have been instrumental in helping us win this deal from the very beginning, and that is valuable, and I do want that on my next deal. So that value add is worth a lot to me not maximizing every single sense on this particular deal. And, and obviously, obviously, doing what you say you're going to do. Or sure. if you're not going to do something, then being transparent, transparent about that pretty huge. quickly. Definitely. And things do change, but just be transparent, be honest. I mean, this is a small world. I, I'm not a very old guy, but I've seen so many people sort of work with me multiple times in different situations, different companies and different businesses. And it's just, you just want to do the right thing all the time. Definitely. It's all about adding value, being honest and transparent. Those are huge points, yep. just in general and anything that you work on, not just solar deals. Absolutely. You mentioned it before, but 
If people want to learn more about Blue Flame Finance, where should they go? So the best source is probably our website, which is Blue Flame Energy Finance, one word, dot com. And it's just Blue Flame Energy Finance dot com. We also have alias as hyperqual.com. It goes to the same website. Sure. So hyperqual, hyperqual is easier to remember. You can also... Uh, and that's of, H-Y-P-E-R-Q-U-A-L, right? Yes. You can also follow us on Twitter or send me a friend request on my friend or like <laughs> connection request on LinkedIn. Uh, I don't use Facebook, but I use friend request because everybody in the in the industry I know have become a lot of people have become good friends, friends. Yes. Um, on LinkedIn. All these are good sources, and we are all also there in conferences. Generally speaking, um, either exhibiting well, exhibiting has been more recent phenomenon, but we are oh. generally there and uh, try to connect with as many people as we can, and and so on and so forth. Great. Well, Abhinash, this was an amazing interview. You provided a lot of great perspective in the industry because you have so much knowledge and so much deal experience. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for being on the Solar Maverick podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Benoit. Oh, you're welcome. Nice talking to you. Great talking to you. Thank you so much for listening. If this content is delivering value to you, please go to iTunes and Stitcher Radio and leave us a five-star review. That helps us build this community, and that's what we're all about right now, building this community as big as we can to deliver as much value as we can. 